you and i are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right well i'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right there's only an up or down this is the no doubt about it podcast no doubt about it and now your hosts christy and mark runcetti Yeah, you know, every once in a while, there is a event that happens in your family that makes you realize how precious life is. And we have one of those today. Christy's playing hurt in a big way. <laughs> hey, gosh. She You're... has a piece of meat <laughs> stuck in her tooth. <laughs> I am going to kill you. From what she made, green chili stew. I'm going to kill you right yeah, now. It's in there. It's lodged in there right now. <laughs> Thanks she for can't telling get it everybody out. that. Well, you, you came into the studio just letting everybody know. <laughs> Ella, Ella's like, what's happening? And you're like, you don't understand. I got a piece <laughs> of meat stuck in here. <laughs> That's what I sounded like. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it was yelling about it. And unbelievable. 500-pound like man. I mean, no, I don't sound like that, by the way. Well, and no. I th- thanks no, for sharing. No, a 500-pound man doesn't leave meat stuck in his teeth. <laughs> No, that it ends up right down in the old gullet. Listen, I don't know what's going on. That's I, I, it's I don't normally have that situation. Yeah, but it's there right we now. We don't have any, any floss for some reason. We have floss. I got floss downstairs. I, I can't find it, and I can't find any toothpicks because the girls use toothpicks like for art projects or something down there. So yeah. anyway, no. I'll take care of that when we get done with the show. Okay. Are you going to be the able? The fact that you told that story uh, yeah. to the, everybody that's listening when yeah. I—that's just rude. I'm going to find a story on you then next time. Right. No, no question. If I show up here. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. If I have like a hangnail and I'm like, I can't even function. (laughs) I can't even do this. You don't understand what I'm doing right here. I didn't say I couldn't handle it. You would climb all over me for that. I did not say. You're right. I would. But I did not say that I couldn't But it's all you can think about, isn't it? Shut up, guy. Let's move forward. Okay, all right. God, there's bigger things to talk about than that. But by the way, my green chili stew. It was good. It's delicious. Delicious. Yeah, it's it actually my friend Carla's recipe. Yeah. And it is so good. So maybe we'll share that recipe too. So. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It was excellent. Stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. A lot going on. A uh, couple things on this episode we're going we're gonna to touch on. Uh, we're going to get into some of what's happening with the border issues uh, right off the top. We're going to talk about that because the state of Texas is now putting up a fence between New Mexico and Texas. We'll explain why that is. We're going to get into more on what's going on in Israel with um, the Palestinians and Hamas. Talk about that. And we're going to bring in Greg Zanetti, former candidate for governor and uh, brigadier general. He's actually an investment guy as well. Greg's a very interesting guy on what's going on. Now, it's a tough conversation. Right. We don't. I don't want to, you know tell you that this is going to be one of these conversations where we don't address serious issues. It's a tough, it's a tough conversation. Yeah. He's got some interesting um, theories on yes. all kinds of things yeah. from uh, yeah. where we, he thinks this, this war with Israel and um, the Palestinians is heading yep. and, and how you it know. might impact us here yeah. and how it impacts finances and all kinds of things. So yeah, he's, he's uh, very interesting. It's, it's yeah. interesting to talk to him yeah. because of the fact that really the only time I knew the guy was during the primary. Right. Um, and and you don't really get to know the other candidates that great during a right. primary because it's kind of like playing with the opposite team. You know, you're like in a competition or sure. you're in a, you know, so you see each other at all the events. You're cordial. You might meet each other's spouses. And then that's kind of it. Sometimes you're cordial. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right. Sometimes but, it's cordial. No, and the interesting thing but, about Greg is he's Greg is in, just a, a deep thinker about a bunch of different things. And one of those people that, that you just want to have his perspective. And he's a really interesting guy in that respect. So I, I, I'm excited for you to hear this conversation, although it's tough. And then once that's over, we do have more. We have Bigfoot news, breaking Bigfoot news. And it's Bigfoot news from our area. Right. So this is something that you need to stick around I, for. We need to have like some special Bigfoot music I right know. now. I don't know what that is. Well, you know, know. We'll have to find some sort of I'm like cur- breaking news Bigfoot sound effect. I like, wonder if you really want to know the truth about Bigfoot. You can't handle the truth. That's right. That's what I'm worried about with you. Oh, no. That's what I'm worried you about. You know what you. it is? This is another reason why we like the, the show sh- Suits so much. Right. It's because they constantly... Um, quote movie lines. And you and I do that religiously. And I don't know a lot of other people like as a couple that throw movie lines back and forth to each other all the time. Right. And I think that that's why one of the reasons we like suits so much is because Harvey and, 
and Mike just constantly throw uh, quotes at each other. So, right. Yeah. No, and, and I think we could. My guess is if we tried, we'd go 20 minutes without using a real sentence. Oh, easy. Yeah. You throw in the, a whole Dumb and Dumber show, you want to throw in uh, Tommy well, Boy, you want to uh, throw in Few Good Men. Uh, I mean, we got all, all kinds of stuff there. Uh, but yeah. Well, and then you go serious, you get a little Shawshank mixed oh, in. Oh, I do. Love I mean, there's Shawshank. all kinds yeah, of stuff yeah, you can do. No, it's very good. Anyway. It's very good. Okay, yeah. First off, let's start with some yeah, it's been five only, stars yeah, and quotes. It, right. Yeah. Because it's been, a, it's been a couple of weeks since I've given any uh, feedback on comments from viewers, but we really appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. We're, I've seen a massive uptick in our um, reviews on Apple Podcasts. Yeah. And yeah, then a lot of comments on our YouTube channel yeah. for each individual show, which I love. I think people give good, really good feedback there, whether they're in favor of what we've said or they're not. For the most part, they're, everybody's really cordial on there. Sometimes yeah. people disagree with each other, but they're still, you know, ultimately pretty polite about it. So I really appreciate our little community there. But um, a couple of these comments that came in over last Monday's show. So the show that we talked mainly, the whole focus was on Israel. We right. also had Nate Heisek yep. again from Calvary Church to talk about the impact and what maybe um, Bible prophecy has to say about this war, maybe how it has impact on it. These are some of the comments from that. They said, sad, maddening, but excellent podcast. Thanks to Nate for clarity and some hope. Keep on keeping on, Mark and Christy. Uh, another great episode. Very sad. Brought tears to my eyes, but you brought light to the reality of what is going on as ugly as it is. And we know we won't get this level in depth of information anywhere else. The media cannot be trusted and Nate's perspective on all was interesting and appreciated. Great podcast. It was nice to hear some positive comments from Nate that gives me hope for the future of this country. Same here. I couldn't agree more. Another great podcast. And thank you for stepping up to the plate and informing us. So sad all this stuff is happening week this past weekend. Um, and then one one fun one um, that I wanted to I pulled from our um, Apple podcast. Yeah. It says this podcast is not just informative and insightful, but Mark and Christie's banter often make it fun and light. They dive not just into New Mexico politics, but also tackle big issues that impact the entire country. Good guests, good content, and overall just a great podcast. Oh, so very, cool. very nice. So thanks, yeah. you guys. Keep those keep those coming. Um, and I told a lot of people a while ago to be guessing your ringtone. I am getting some of those comments back, yeah. too. I'm going to give you guys a warning right now. Nobody's guessed the right ringtone that Mark actually has. Yeah. So keep guessing, and we'll play a little game with that. I'm gonna re I've been saving those comments of, of folks that have been making guesses. So yeah. anyway, make sure you follow our YouTube channel. Please hit that subscribe button. We're really trying to get to 5,000 subscribers as quickly as we can, and we'd appreciate you just hitting that subscribe yeah, button. Yeah, and, and yeah, and Apple Podcasts as well. The, the overall numbers and the total viewer numbers for for clips and everything else we're doing is is very very strong so that's we're thrilled with that yeah and so thankful and feel blessed so and i also feel blessed this was our uh our anniversary weekend it was yeah. and all the gifts that you poured all over me I was know, just I showered so you with gifts. showered me with gifts and as attention. usual yeah and per usual <laughs> per usual well, we usual. went out to, we went out to dinner we did we went to a new restaurant that well it's at least new to us again <laughs> once again we're on the cutting edge probably but in Corrales, uh, called 4940. Yeah. Friends of ours recommended us going yeah, there. Yeah, it's excellent. And it was, um, oh, it was, oh, the old yeah, school there's pictures. Yeah. For yeah. those of you watching, this is a couple pictures from the old wedding at the uh, Basic, La Fonda. The La Fonda, yeah. And basically, deck. if you yeah. see some of these photos that we shared, um, we're laughing the whole time. I mean, I don't know if I couldn't laugh harder. Like, we just laugh. I laughed the whole ceremony. I remember laughing the uh, ceremony. Yeah, it I turned remember... out to be a bit of a joke, the ceremony. <laughs> it did. Well, <laughs> that was not true. our. So that maybe not our trail, early but intention, but it is it what it really is. It wasn't really by us either. But yes. anyway, no, great. It was a fun weekend. It's always fun to kind of look back on the day you got married and yep. all the things that have happened since then. The fact that we've made it through two political campaigns and we still love each other is, <sighs> and like each other. Unreal. And they have the ability to still laugh and well, have fun. Well, we were talking about that last or the night we had dinner a couple nights ago. And it was that I, I think that sometimes in a marriage, when you go through just a lot, whatever it is, you know, like whether it's a health thing or, or, or difficult times financially or, or, or whatever it is. I, I think if you, if you make sure that you make God the center of your marriage, that can, that can make you stronger, but it doesn't make it easy. No. You know, and marriage, so, I don't think is ever easy. Yeah. I think they're, you know, it just, it's like teamwork all the time. Like it, you see anybody do teamwork building in a, in yeah. a work environment or in a school project, whatever marriage is teamwork all the time. And yeah. so I think it's, you know, trying to get used to having somebody in your space initially. And then yeah. as you start raising kids together or you, we have several businesses together, you know, right. kind of figuring the, those things out. Obviously we do the podcast together. We've done TV right. show together. Um, it's just, you know, we just have to try to figure that out. And I do think that, you know, basically the reason that 
we both come back to an agreement place is because of our individual relationships with Christ and with God and making him the centerpiece of our life. I mean, I think it's just a matter of like, you can't complete me, you know, to quote another famous movie line, right? Like as sweet as that is in the movie, it's- You had me (laughs) at hello. (laughs) That movie is brutal. No, it's still good. It still ends up over time. It's a little shaky, but anyway, go ahead. Anyway, um, I'm just saying that like, you know, I think a, a big thing I did maybe in my earlier relationships dating relationships and stuff is you kind of look for that person to make you happy and to make you feel more complete and whole. And it's like, that is, if once you start doing that, wow, there's a lot of pressure on that other person to be some sort of perfect being and some miraculous, you know, prince. And let's be honest, that is just not you. And so uh, just kidding. This is going on a long time. It is. Let's keep moving on then. Okay. Anyway, happy anniversary. No, happy anniversary to you. (laughs) You are the greatest wife ever. Yes. You're I, my favorite wife no, that thanks. I've had. Thank you. That I've had. Thanks. You're definitely you're number <laughs> Thank you one so right, much. right now. We'll see. I mean, we'll see we'll what happens. We'll see. I'll take the vote out later. But yeah. anyway, let's move on. Yeah. So solar eclipse, yes. obviously, everybody out there um, with their glasses on. I think, I mean, it is am I wrong? But what this was the view from everybody. It wasn't just like if you were in New Mexico, right? Like no, no, it, no, 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 no. It was the view in New Mexico. Oh, so the view you're seeing okay. here is New Mexico. Yeah, it depends. You have to be along the path. The, the path of the eclipse. So yeah. So Oregon and then it cut down through parts of the mountain west through here. So yeah, you had to be in the right spot for to Got get it. that view that you just saw. Well, and it, you know, if you are here in New Mexico, you obviously if you walked outside, it was dark. It was like a weird, it was oh, yeah. weird lighting felt very um, like, I don't know, in times, but it also had like a haze to it. Yeah. And so it reminded me of when we have some of those really bad wildfires is honestly what the lighting looked like. Yeah. You know, and it's what, 1030 in the morning and it looks like it's five o'clock at night. Yeah. And then the shadows, what were so cool. I yeah. mean, you looked on the, this is our driveway and you can mm-hmm. see the, all you the know, rings. all the rings. It's super cool. So, and obviously everybody, a lot of people went out to Bloom Fiesta Park, checked it out there. It was just an incredible time. So obviously really amazing stuff there. And, and a great balloon fiesta, really. It was a good balloon fiesta Yeah, week. I think they got up almost yeah. every day except for one, yeah. I think, yeah, is the had, wind. I think so. Thursday was a static display. Otherwise, it was, it was really good. So that's worked out. We need moisture badly. I mean, we are... You go down and look at the real grand. I mean, it's uh, it's rough. I mean, uh, it is a, a tough go. And it, we, w- my uh, here's my weather knowledge right here. Oh, Remember geez. that we should show my weather blooper at some point yeah. when I try to do weather basically yeah. one time before the news director was like, she's never doing that again. Yeah. And then forcibly <laughs> so it, remove you. It was pretty bad. Yeah. But anyway, um, it, 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 with it being an El Nino year, really, we're not expecting a lot of that moisture until, say, January, right? Or kind of- well, it depends. I mean, it, some a lot of the long-term stuff shows it ramping up slowly here over the next couple of months. Okay. So we'll see how it shakes out. But again, an El Nino year is not a guarantee of an above-average snowpack. Usually, it's pretty good. But again, it's it's one of these things where it's not out of the question that it, it, it won't be perfect. So we'll see how that shakes out. But it's been a really, really dry summer and, and fall. Right. There's no doubt. All right. Okay. Should we get to it? Yeah, let's get to it. We All got right, a lot of stuff yeah, to talk about. Yeah, let's start with the fence. Yeah. And this is a story. Ella, it's clip 14. And so Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, has gone out and said, we got a problem here. And that is that Texas is doing everything they can along their border to stop the, the out-of-control influx of migrants into the United States, which which now seeing what's happened in Israel and things like that, there's a, there's a renewed focus on things because because the question is when you don't know who's coming in your country at all, you know you, you have no idea what to expect, right? And so that takes you know what Governor Abbott's stance has been, which is we have to secure the border in every single way we can and make that to the forefront. Well, the problem is here in New Mexico, we've done nothing. Okay, so what we're seeing is plenty of people coming in through New Mexico and right around Sunland Park and over into El Paso, that's where everybody's starting to flow in. And so Texas is like, no, like you cannot do this. And so along with this article, Ella Clip 15, we'll just kind of let you know what Governor Abbott is doing here. And we had some discussions with people in Texas on our what our border policy was going to be. We're going to have the border strike force going down, stopping the flow of drugs down across the border, and then adding the National Guard as necessary to help stop that flow as well. That was part of our border plan, too. But here's a look at the quote. It's Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced this week that the Texas National Guard is installing razor wire along the border of Texas and New Mexico on his orders. Migrants are entering New Mexico illegally and then crossing into Texas. We are stopping it, Abbott wrote. So this is in stark contrast, obviously, 
to our governor, Michelle Luan Grisham, who has had no interest in speaking about this at all. And in fact, Abbott is is talked about the fact that the real issue here is the is that there's just very little enforcement on the New Mexico side. And he's made that very clear. And you made it really clear when you ran for office. I mean, I think that border was one of our big, big topics. And and obviously now we see, you know, they're listing out. We talked about this in their um, last Monday's show that we're seeing, you know, terrorists cross over. Um, They're not being tracked. We have cartel coming across. We have so much human trafficking. The fact that it's just been basically an open borderland for the last better part of three years. Right. Um, I don't know what people are thinking. I don't even know where their justification of that is. And just saying, come on, everybody come on in and bring all your crime and bring all your drugs. And, and, you know, we're, you know, are we putting ourselves at risk for an attack here in our homeland? And the answer to me, I believe is yes, absolutely. You can't, you can't leave your border wide open and then think that you're protecting your citizens Against people who would do them harm. I mean, it, it's a, it's a ridiculous statement. Of course, they don't have any idea who's coming through. When when we were in El Paso and going over to Juarez a few months ago, we talked to some people and some border patrol agents and said, "Do you have any idea who's coming in?" And they, and their statement to us was, "You would be shocked and horrified if you saw some of the rap sheets that are coming in here and being released into the interior of the country." And that's not even talking about terrorism. Okay, and what does it look like on the ground? Clip 18 shows us what it looks like on the ground. This is in El Paso where you had a group of migrants in a car going through a golf course. This is a golf course in the middle of the afternoon in El Paso. And you can see CBP chasing them down. Or actually, I think this may be Texas chasing them down, eventually going to hand them to Border Patrol. But they're chasing them through this golf course. Yeah, It's completely lawless. And then if we go to the next clip, what you'll see is they actually took the, the truck and the Jeep and they dumped it right into a, a pond on the golf course. Oh my gosh. This is what it looks like. This is absolutely putting people at risk in this country. And, and this is this makes no sense. And the Biden administration continues to just not address this issue. And, and you see it time after time. And, and Governor Abbott saying, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go ahead and shut down things from New Mexico because they're not taking this issue seriously. Mm -hmm. And and we know that they're going to start bringing people up into Albuquerque as well. Oh, he'll he'll be busing those. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, too, on our show that we're a sanctuary state. They're going to be like, here you go. You guys, you guys are you've asked for this. So here you go. And, you know, we talked to some of the security guards down in um, just in our downtown area. And they said they're seeing people come off the buses that are being sent here from Texas and from other parts because of us being a sanctuary state. Right. So this is going to lead to obviously continued homelessness issues, more drugs, more crime. I don't know how anybody signs on and says this is a good solution when there is it's not even a solution. Right. It's like, let's just not do anything and pray it goes away. Then that doesn't happen with anything. Yeah, no. And so this will we'll continue to track this and we're going to take another trip down south here shortly within the next month or so, I think, to check on what's going on. You know, and I kind of, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, I, I guess if, if local media go down there, right, they're going to be put in some, like, place again, kind of what they try to do to you guys when you first went to the border, where, hey, your media, this is what you stay on, this is your side of, like, look, it's all pretty, nothing's happening here. So that's basically where they might be funneled to, right? Well, well, well I don't think you're going to see that same thing, because they knew at the end of Title 42, they had the whole thing planned out. Well, they don't have planned out now. Like it's it's chaos in El Paso. If you go and talk to business owners, which we've done over the past couple of weeks in El Paso, they'll tell you it's out of control. Mm-hmm. Like it's you just can't. It's completely. Well, and that video came out of El Paso rails. like uh, less than a week ago, and it just shows us everybody just flooding yeah, that it's border a again. It's, a it's nightmare. exactly yep. what we're all we were all fearing. So. Anyway, okay. okay. All right. So a couple things on what's going on in Israel and what's going on in the United States and our reaction to what's going on in Israel. Uh, we are seeing widespread, I I think demonstrations is the best word, that are pro-Palestinian. And especially given what happened last week is incredibly disturbing. So you see what happened at the University of New Mexico. And we're going to talk to to Greg about this too in our, in our next segment about the response, official response from UNM, but this is what it looked like at UNM with with a decent sized demonstration, pro Palestinian demonstration. Again, this is less than a week after you had Hamas go in and just 
wipe out as many men, women, and children as they possibly yeah, can. Yeah, and you know, and the most horrifying thing to me is when they when we found out that they were in the hospitals and just killing babies, killing babies in the NICU yeah. unit, and, kill, and you know, beheading children, and just. I mean, I don't know how anybody in their right mind gets out there and says, hey, yeah, this is a normal, this is a, for a bunch of freedom fighters. These aren't freedom well, fighters. No, I, I really do think there's there's an, there, there's a level of ignorance here that is staggering. But but you have people standing up, literally siding with exterminating Jewish people. It's, it's unbelievable. And, and I, I never thought we would said, see this. Right. Instead of saying like pro-Palestinian. It should say pro Hamas because basically they're pro terrorists. I mean, I don't. I, well, I can't they were speak elected back in 2007. They haven't had an election since. But then you're seeing college campuses now in places like Harvard, where Harvard has come out. They had 30 student groups who went out and sided with the terrorists, right? And, and, and they and they said the Israeli regime is entirely responsible for the violence. Oh, my gosh. Talked about victim blaming. And then you have a place like Harvard who won't let common conservative speakers come in and talk. And then they allow this. Well, I don't know how anybody thinks that Hamas is pro-American, pro-women, pro-LGBTQ, pro-freedom. They're not. They're against all of those things. So I, I feel like asking those people, like, what? Part of this terrorist cell activity, do you do you understand? Like, why are you de- when I see a woman out there defending this, yeah. I'm shocked. Yeah. Because you're you're the one person that they don't want to hear anything from. Nothing from you, right? right? And they've abused women for decades. Right. The last place I'd ever want to be defending is that group. And I I, you know, there's definitely um peaceful Muslim groups. Absolutely this is not are. one of them. Right, right. So the yeah, fact that you're defending yeah. this it doesn't make any sense. And again, I go back to that, you know, that whole thing of there's 22 Arab countries. There's 55 area uh, majority majority that were that are Muslim based. Right. And Absolutely. there is one Jewish nation. One. So my which is goodness, the, which, by the way, is basically the size of New Jersey <laughs> in total. So. um And I will give credit. I think Chuck Schumer deserves credit. He just came out. This was Sunday evening. He's come out um, and he said he denounces anti-Israel protests and he goes after his own party in many ways. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. And this is a quote from The New York Post. Chuck Schumer denounced U.S. protests against Israel's retaliatory strikes on Gaza and call in the calls for a ceasefire. He denounced those from his fellow Democrats. Who, who especially not not the majority of Democrats, I don't think in this case, but there's no doubt the squad has been all over this. And, and he went after him and he said the New York Democrats said he'd work to ensure that Israel has everything they need to totally eliminate the terrorist group in the Gaza Strip, adding that he feels vindicated for opposing former President Barack Obama's release of money to Iran back when Obama was president in 2014. If the threat of Hamas is not eliminated, they will do it again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Give, you know, look, too often people get all hung up on the on the politics of this and and, and dividing people on each side. But I'll tell you what, Chuck Schumer, he stood up and said the right things. And I think he deserves credit for that. And he said one other thing that was interesting in Elliot's clip eight. He said, and I think this is so important. And we'll get into why this is on on the right side of the aisle too here in a second because I think you're seeing plenty of of people that are that are on the right side of the aisle start to walk away from Israel or, or maybe always have okay. Mm-hmm. But Schumer said one of the things he said: I wish protesters would have listened to the twelve families who had people whose relatives were taken hostage. Schumer told the Post, he said they were all crying, they were mm-hmm. all listening to these people because they were over in Israel, and, and they went over and talked to him. He said to a person they're all crying because it's easy to sit on a college campus and hear part of one story put on a flag and go out and support something that you have no concept of what it is and what damage it does and the families that it tears apart so when you're out doing all of this and your protests you don't know the human toll and i guarantee you you don't know the history anybody who says Israelis are occupiers or is ridiculous or colonists or Or colon. And yeah, they're calling crack a Bible. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, give me a break when you look at this. And so that's the part of it that is so infuriating is that you see people that don't care to know what's happening. They want a cause. They want something to go marching up and down with. And because of that, we're starting to see some real interesting fractures, even on people that are on the right side of the aisle. 
And so I, I want to kind of go through a little bit of this with you. We've seen, you know, Ben Shapiro's sort of been the tip of the spear with a lot of this stuff. He is Israeli. Or he's not Israeli. He's Jewish. Jewish. Um, he's born here. But um, but he regularly goes back to Israel. He's very hard line on this. Is like, look, this is horrendous. And and I tend to agree with him. Okay, but but on the far right, you, you've got people, you know, some of them are associated with Turning Point. Some of them are not. But but there's this far right portion that's that basically don't want to help Israel either in any way, shape or form. And, and you saw this uh, w- one of these girls is Morgan Ariel. She works with Turning Point. She, she said she had a comment on Ben Shapiro and what he's been saying. She said that explains why Ben Shapiro is foaming at the mouth right now like a rabid dog over the onslaught of Palestinian civilians. Um but just saying that he's celebrating that civilians would be injured is not it's just a, it goes against completely what he is defending and what he is saying is he's against what the Hamas are doing to his Israeli there is Israelis but he's not saying hey yeah let's go attack the civilians you know and the and the difference i really am seeing too is that there has been a lot of warning coming out of Israel to for civilians to get out of Gaza right get out pack up your stuff and get out of here cuz it's going to get even worse than it is already so leave. I mean, I, I don't understand. This is not even the same thing. They came in unannounced and shot elderly at the bus stops, pulled people out of their homes, you know, d- dropped in on a con- a peace concert and just shot people. Right. You know, it's it's horrible. And, and so you see that. Right. You see what she says, a turning point. But then Eric Erickson, who is a conservative, who has a big following. He goes back and what she says and says, at this point, Turning Point USA is looking like not just a grifting operation, which some people have made the case against Turning Point USA for that, but an anti-Semitic grifting operation. So this is all on the right. Mm -hmm. okay? and and you just kind of go, whoa. And and then one of the most interesting debates, and we want to show you some of this because it's it's fascinating. Megyn Kelly jumped into a debate with Vivek Ramaswamy. OK, and Vivek's overall point was um, and we're big fans, obviously, of Megyn Kelly. But uh, so Vivek's overall point was, look, all these protests at, at student, you know, student run protests at universities. Look, they're, they're clueless right now. They'll come around. You know, don't give up on this. You know, don't go after them in, in such a way. And, and here's what Megyn Kelly said. And she said, if they're not persuaded that murdering babies is wrong, then there's no persuading them. We don't hire those who do the killing and we don't hire those who applaud the killers while the savagery is underway. If you're open to hiring one of these lunatics though, good to know. So she rips into Vivek. Okay. Mm -hmm. She also ripped into him by defending this and is wanting to be a president too. I don't know if we have that text. Right. No, we don't. But 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 yes. But mm. But yeah. So she goes after him and says, look, there's no, there's no convincing them. Okay. Then Candace Owens, again, everybody here is on the right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Candace Owens then jumps in. Okay. And she goes with this, she goes this route. Oh, stop it. This is incredibly disingenuous, Megan. You know that many of those students are not out there because they want babies murdered. College kids are stupid. I used to be radically pro-choice. Glad I didn't get put on a conservative blacklist for wanting babies murdered. As it turned out, I was just young and temporarily brainwashed from a public school education coupled with mainstream Hollywood lies. And not because I legitimately wanted to see infants torn from their mother's womb. Okay, this is an interesting debate. It's a deeper debate than what it looks like here. They went back and forth quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I tell you what, as you look at what Megyn Kelly is saying and what Candace Owens is saying, basically what Megyn Kelly is saying is, look, the, the, the days of kids being able to be educated back into normalcy may well be over. And I think she's right. Mm-hmm. Because remember, what we're looking at now is we're talking about kids who are going to do and do have Google searches that are going to they're going to end up being siloed and their Google search is going to effectively reinforce their priors. Mm-hmm. So the thought process that you would be educated again and, and you would learn new things and, and come along to have a different point of view is wrong. Now, we are now siloed to the point where you may never get out of those views. No, so, and there's an agenda when I, you go to certain colleges now. So 
you got to be careful. I mean, as we're looking at certain schools for people to go to, our girls to go to, it's nerve wracking because, uh, you know, while there was definitely professors that felt a certain way and you could pick up on that, I just don't believe it was as hardcore of an agenda push as it is now to the point where you are concerned as a parent what school you send your kid to. And it's it can just be a state university. And you're concerned that the agenda there to push the far left agenda is too strong. Right. And to a point that it is a brainwashing, that well, it, it yeah. is a, an absolute brainwashing. And then you couple it with what you're saying with the Google searches and the fact that everything is going to be an echo chamber for these guys coming out. It's not like you it, this just wasn't the case when we were when we were coming through school. You, it, it wasn't like you kind of thought you knew where you lined up when you were maybe 20 to 22. You get out, you start working, you know, you start like being in the real world paying more attention to the local news, paying attention to national news, and then you formulate your own opinions. I don't know if that's going to happen anymore. And that's really, really scary. Yeah. Because we're so divided. Well, we're divided. And then you never end up with, and I think this is the point Megan Kelly's making, is that people are where they are. So you got to meet them where they are. And if for you to expect, like Candace Owens does, that, that they're going to evolve now, that's an assumption that is not borne out by the evidence. Now it's, guess what? I have these priors and whatever I put into Google, that's going to be reinforced and my opinion's never going to change unless something significant happens to make it change. And so I think Megan's point is, hey, look, if you're going to be this way, then let's dance. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, just maybe, you'll get some information through. And Candace has a different view. It's an interesting debate, but it just shows you what's happening on the right side of the aisle here, which is is not something that I think necessarily we saw coming. But this just shows how many different parts to this are working, and and, and it's it's a little scary across the board. I mean, obviously, everything that's happened is horrible, but this whole thing is scary. Right, and it really is just even the coverage, how they talk about it, how they angle it, how, yeah. who, who where you're getting the information from. Because you can watch one station, which we've done a lot of that, and they're really – really going harsh after Israel. Yeah. Really harsh. Yep. And, you know, and then you listen to other folks like that we normally listen to, and it's just not the same at all. It's not even close to that. So it's, again, you're in your own silo, you're in your own tunnel, your own echo chamber, and it's just telling you what you want to hear. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's... Yeah. No, and just one more thing, uh -huh. by the way, for people who think that the, the whole Middle East is 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 pulling for for Palestine and and in the and especially Hamas in this particular case, just came out from Reuters. It's clip number thirteen. Ella, Iran warns Israel. They say, "Don't attack us, and we won't engage you." Okay. It says Iran said on Sunday that if Israel does not attack it, its interests or its citizens, then Iran's armed forces would not engage in a military conflict with Israel. Now we don't know if this will stay. Don't know how that's going to shake out. But the thought process that Iran would say, eh, we're going to cut Hamas loose and let them deal with whatever they're going to deal with. They were likely involved in the planning. Mm -hmm. And now Iran goes back and says, Hamas, sorry, but if we get in this with you, we're going to get leveled, especially in Lebanon and could be further than that. Their, their nuclear interests could be at, at risk as well. So just kind of interesting to see that a lot of cases, you know, this whole Hamas thing and in this thought process that everybody's lined up behind them in the Middle East. No, not necessarily. No, I think it could be more like, uh, you know, China, Russia, we'll have to see who's really behind all this, who's helping fund this. Yep. Um, you know, because as you've said, Hamas is well funded. Well, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's Iran who's funding it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, well, you know, we'll see what other roles there are. Right. And so and we'll talk to Greg Zanetti about that in just a couple minutes and, and, and get his and, opinion. Yeah. And, you know, real fast, because I because it is kind of a, a Debbie Downer thing on this a little bit. We in church today, I really appreciated the fact that, you know, um, we're filming this on a Sunday and our church service on Sunday. We prayed for Israel. We prayed for the people of Israel. And it was more of like finding out like, hey, God knows what's going to happen. And if you are somebody of great faith and that you have put all your trust in God, this is not a time to live in a state of fear. This is a time to just be paying attention, knowing your scripture, and basically making sure your house is in order, making sure you know where you are with your walk with God. And I thought that was really positive, a positive way of looking at this situation as well. So it's not just always, you know, just doom and gloom kind yeah. of thing. No. You know? Yeah. No, you're right. And, and, and it is. It's absolutely right. This is... This is the basis of what our faith is for in mm -hmm. uncertain times, depending on it. 
Mm-hmm. And that having been said, <laughs> what you're about to hear is a pretty tough conversation. Mm-hmm. So, but it's a, it's a meaningful one and, and one that I think you'll be really interested in as we go through it. So uh, right after this, we will uh, talk to Greg Zanetti. You're listening to the No Doubt About It podcast. Back to your hosts, Christy and Mark Ronchetti. Well, it is our honor to <laughs> bring honor. to bring former <laughs> adversary. I can't even believe I said former adversary. adversary. I don't know. <laughs> a guy who uh, ran for governor of the state of New Mexico in, in uh, 2022 and was a tremendous candidate and somebody we wanted to have you come on, Greg Zanetti, mm-hmm. uh, Brigadier General, uh, you... You're in the middle of the investment world. You're in the middle of the military world. Uh, New Mexico is lucky to have you. And we wanted to have you come in and, and discuss some of these issues and what's going on. It turns out you guys are not total rivals in in yeah. real life, which is good. No. no. Yeah. We should we should like do some sort of pickleball doubles championship. You know what I mean? I think we'd be There's great. Some arm wrestling. I you really do. Across the table oh, yeah. from each other. <laughs> win. <laughs> no, I, first of all, thanks thanks for coming in. When everything you know started to happen in Israel, uh, you were the first name we sort of thought of to, to talk about a, a bunch of different things. You're somebody who takes your faith very seriously. We love that part. We want to talk about that part, and we want to talk about what all of this means, maybe tactically, and then what it means for this country in this state even, and then where do we go from here? Okay. Uh, so first of all, give us a little bit, for people who don't know you that well and may have seen that you ran and uh, don't know exactly what your background is, can you explain a little bit of that? And, and it, it's a pretty good story. Okay, all right. We'll start military, then we'll go to business. And okay. by the way, they both, they link. Yeah. All right. I went from Valley High School to West Point. By the way, my West Point roommate was a uh, Russian linguist. And Jeez. so I've been studying Russians my whole life. Gotcha. So I uh, served on active duty over in Germany, had two company-level commands, and then in the course of my career, two battalion-level commands, a regimental command, two brigade-level commands, and then finally I commanded a joint task force of soldiers, sailors, airmen, airmen marines, coast guard at Guantanamo Bay. Part of that was, was active duty, part of it was National Guard, and I had a second career, um, one more piece. Let's see, I'm graduate with the of the uh, Command and General Staff College, the U.S. Army War College, and have a master's degree in strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. All right. On the finance side, I've been managing money since 1986, master's degree in business from Boston University, and I've managed money for some of the richest people in the world. I've been very blessed. So money and war go together. And if you don't understand both of those, you don't get the full picture, and that's probably enough about me. No, it's interesting, and we'll get to how that fits into what's going on in the Ukraine, too, if we, we get enough time to do that. Sure. But let's start with what happened last Saturday. As you sat there, you got up on Saturday morning, and you see things starting to unfold, not only what Hamas was doing, but the way they were doing it with the brutality in which they did it. Sure. What, what, what first of all, went through your mind in all of this? Was it something that completely shocked you, or was this like, no, this isn't a surprise at all? Well, I was surprised that it happened the way it happened and and how ill-prepared Israel seemed to be, because that seemed off. Uh, at the same time, these kind of things happen, and I'm not going to go down in conspiracy land, so we'll just we'll leave it at that. But look at the tactics that they used. They've been learning from what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. And so what did they use? They used the drones. I think what's happened here, let's see, a $10,000 drone can take out a multi-million dollar tank. Uh, the satellites see everything, hear everything on the battlefield. Uh, you've got drones that hover over a battlefield, and they can differentiate through their software. Is it a tank? Is it an armored personnel carrier? Is it a uh, just a bus? And then in Ukraine, what's happening is it will immediately send the coordinates back to the firing batteries, the anti-tank guided missile groups, or, or to the helicopters over the horizon. And then the operator gets paid 500 rubles for taking out a tank. 200 rubles for taking out an armor personnel carrier. It's almost like a video game. Mm-hmm. So what happened during this attack, it was drones and then missiles. Right. That's the second piece. Mark, these missiles have become incredibly inexpensive to make. Right. And so they overwhelmed the Iron Dome system, and then they bring in the drones, and then they... <laughs> And then just your basic, you know, run through the fences, which was surprising to me. And then we saw right. burning tanks... And then the massacre of the civilians. All right. Remember, I was the deputy commander at Guantanamo Bay. 
Mark, I lived with these guys for over a year through the camps. How they think is so much different. Yeah, what is that? Take us into the mind of someone who would give their life to, to take someone who's, and we're watching video of this just a second ago on just innocent people being rounded up and murdered. For most of us, we think there must be some logic behind any sort of thought. How would you explain the way they think? Well, it goes back to the religion. It always goes back to the religion. And so how is it that you can please Allah? Well, you take out the infidel. And so it doesn't matter to them if it is a child or a non-combatant, a civilian. It, it all, they're all a cancer on the world that needs to be taken out. And this was hard for me at Gitmo to come to grips going through the camps every day with this kind of mentality that they really do hate you. Hmm. And it is hard for us to understand that with our way of thinking. And so once you get to that point, you realize, okay, the only way you're going to deal with this is it is force. And as long as you are in the stronger position, you can keep it at bay. The minute they have the upper hand, that's it. it. That's it. Okay. And go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, uh, what was your response to what we're hearing in America during over the weekend. I mean, I, I was so shocked right. to see any support of Hamas. I mean, maybe that's just my naivety, you know, but I'm thinking nobody's going to support these guys killing babies you know, and going into NICUs and lighting babies on fire and killing elderly and raping young women. I, I don't know how anybody in their right mind supports that. Well, let's, let's, let me show you some numbers before you yeah. answer this. Ella, let's go to clip seven. Look at these numbers on on one. The Democratic Party has changed significantly right. on this issue. If you look at the numbers here, you go back to January of 2013. Well, who do you support right. you know, between the two, Palestinians or, or Israelis? And then you go to now, right. and you see now the vast majority of – at least people in the Democratic Party now have much more of a, a support of the Palestinians. Does that explain some of what we're seeing? Oh, absolutely. It's been an amazing propaganda campaign. And so you look how this is playing out right now. I want you to think about, though, how these alliances have changed uh, because you've got Sunnis and Shias. Do you understand how that kind of broke out, or yeah. should I explain it real quick? I think you should give a quick explanation right. for anybody that doesn't know. All right, so when, when Muhammad died, he left no clear line of succession. So almost immediately there was a fight over this new rising religion, and it broke out, it broke out over uh, ethnic lines, either Persians or Arabs. Well, the Arabs kind of got the upper hand first. They're Sunnis. All right, the Persians think Iran. They're Shias. Yeah. All right, what's Hamas? Hamas is primarily Sunni, I mean, Arab. And yet, where were they getting their funding? Iran. Right. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. That's not supposed to work. They've been at each other's throats forever. Right. Hezbollah is the opposite. Right. Hezbollah is Shia. Yep. But the Arabs, Saudis, are coming out in favor of Hezbollah. Who negotiated that detente, that peace between the two just earlier this summer? China. China came in and made helped make peace between the ancient Persians and Arabs, and now comes the attack. And look where and now you said you want to talk a little bit about this scripturally. Not, yeah. None of this was by accident for the day, besides it being everybody talked about the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. But right. you know that Yom Kippur moves every year. The day it happened was the last day of the fall feasts outlined in Leviticus numbers, and so it's called Sukkot. The last day is what is supposed to mark what the next year is going to look like. Oh, okay. Here it happened go. on that day. Yeah. Where did it occur? It occurred at Beersheba. Yeah. Wait a minute. Go back to Genesis. This is when Abraham and Abimelech, a Philistine, cut a deal over that well. Basically, it was over water rights. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically it. Right. And so the first battles are there. All right, and then now let's spring over to what Netanyahu just said a couple of days ago. Yep. He said, if Hezbollah gets involved, we are going to consider Damascus in play. Fine. All right, go to Isaiah 17. Yep. What's that all about? That Isaiah sees something that is so disturbing to him, he can't even describe it. And so he talks about the utter destruction of Damascus. This has never happened in history. 
Uh, you go back to, let's see, Paul was struck down on the road too. Mm-hmm. Damascus. He even says Damascus. in the New Testament what yeah. street he went to. Straight street. It's still there. Yeah. Damascus advertises itself as the longest continually occupied city in the world. And now you've got the biblical part playing in. Now you have to flip over to the Quran. What does the Quran talk about? In the end days, the Mahdi, the Almighty, the, the twelfth Imam will mm-hmm. rise up out of the earth. This is their end times eschatology. Eleven right. have come and gone, but he comes right during time of great bloodshed. It is incumbent upon the Muslims to bring in the great bloodshed, the flame of Islam, to then bring in their Messiah. And so you've got these competing end times eschatologies happening right now at these ancient places. If you are not thinking in terms of religion, when you are analyzing Mideast wars versus Ukraine, when we talk about Ukraine, you don't think like this. Right, right, right. It's a dynamic that Westerners don't understand, but if you do comprehend it, you realize how quickly this can escalate far beyond what it is now. And so let's look at that on a map for a second, because I think that is a, it instructs a little bit of where we need to, because I don't right. think everybody fully appreciates, well, when you talk about from the river to the sea, you're talking about wiping out Israel. Right. I mean, r- really. And so let's look at where we are. Ella, let's go to map two, and, and this will just give us a, a first off... Um, Oh, sorry, kiddo. I think that's the... Oh, sorry. That's map three. There you go. Okay. So this is a little tighter view here. So for people who to kind of give you an idea where everything went down, obviously you have the Gaza Strip, which we're talking about right now, roughly, what, 25 miles long, six miles wide, uh, basically given over to... In 2005. In 2005, and Hamas elected in what, 2007, something like that. So they take over, basically, and, and they go occasionally back and forth with Israel, lobbing some lobbing some rockets. You've got the Iron Dome. And then you also have the West Bank, where obviously there's significant Arab right. influence there. Ancient and, Samaria, by the way. Yes, absolutely. And then, Ella, let's go to the next map, just a little wider view here to show you to the north when we talk about what's happening with Hezbollah and and, right. and what's happening in, in Lebanon. That's just to the north, right? Right. And they're no friend of Israel. No. And then we're talking Jordan. There's a good relationship there. There's a decent yeah. relationship with Egypt, right? But then you go over to Syria. So talk about how quick Quickly, if we're looking at a scenario here, not only biblically but but practically here in this particular case, how if this thing's going to expand quickly, right? How does it expand quickly, and where are the biggest flashpoints? All right. Well, I would start in Damascus. But let's go back to the Gaza. Can we go back to the yeah, Gaza? the tight one? Yeah, yeah next the other one, Ella. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Perfect. All yep. right. So look at the southern part of that. That abuts Egypt. Yep. I think what Netanyahu wanted to do was open up that yep, side flood them out of there, right? And flood Get them, them out into, the, into yep. Sinai. Yep, and, and then go e- level. And Egypt the Gaza said, Strip. "There's no way you are dumping the Palestinians. The Palestinians aren't really liked by either the Sunnis or the Shias guys. They're kind of outcasts, and yeah. always so they've always been kind of a, a tool used yeah. by the other side here. And are they willing to sacrifice Palestinians for the bigger goal? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now let's talk about let's talk about militarily and the technologies now and why this will likely expand. Think what happened to Israel. They got overwhelmed all at once. Yeah. There's no way any air defense system is going to intercept every single one of those missiles, especially when they're in the air. Thus, what you have to do is take them out either at the production facility, yeah. at the ammo depot, or at least at the launchers. Yeah. Well, where are those launchers? Those launchers in can the be in Iran. Gazes. Yeah, they could be in Syria. So, in order for Israel to prevent this from happening, they are going to have to reach out into other countries to start taking these things out. Otherwise, this thing's just going to come in on. And then, does that not? So, we have a couple carrier groups now that have gone. In. Does that not draw us in? Oh heavens, yes. I think where they are, Mark. Yeah. I wish you had a a map, the Mediterranean. Yeah. If you look at it on a map, it's a big lake. Yeah. The hypersonic missiles, the missiles that they have now, the uh, uh, aircraft carriers, a a missile magnet. And I think we're putting two of these with hardly any maneuver room. And I'm not a Navy guy, but I've got a lot of Navy friends going, if I were that admiral, my head would be on a swivel. Heck yeah. How in the world are you going to prevent all of these missiles coming at one you know, and what happens if we lose an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean? Imagine how this thing ratchets we'll go up. Right. Right. And what is the symbol of America's projection of power? If you're seeing the everything. aircraft carrier. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So what we're seeing is major changes in in military 
tactics, techniques, procedures that started in Ukraine. Yeah. The tank, that we canceled the Abrams tank upgrades because $10,000 drones are taking out multi-million yeah, dollar tanks. Yeah, right. It's You're sitting duck. in shining armor that yeah. can't move anymore. Mm -hmm. And so everything's changing. And the, the economics of it, it is so much cheaper to take these things out than what it used to be. And I'll leave it at that. Mm. Well, okay. and, and I, you know, I was talking to you guys about that stat I heard um, earlier, which I think is, again, something that I wasn't even fully aware of until I actually saw the numbers. And it was something like there's 22 Arab nations, right? 55, I think, or 51 Muslim countries, Muslim supporting countries. Right. And there is one Jewish nation, right? It, yeah. it just blows my mind that we're sitting here and, and promoting like anybody in this country promoting an attack on this Jewish nation should right. be ashamed of themselves. Right. And then they use, OK, well, Israel has been mean and cruel to the Palestinians. Right. All right. But let's think this through. Israel has likely had nuclear weapons probably since the 1960s. Yeah. Have they used them against any of their neighbors? No. They had the ability to wipe out. All their neighbors, they could have done it. They have not done this. Yeah. And so, all right, say what you will about Israel, but they've shown remarkable restraint over many decades, and now they're surrounded. And you've got unified Shias and Sunnis uh, working with Russia and China. If I were Israel, I'd be very concerned right now. Yeah, and do you think, and let, by, by the way, let's do this. Ella, let's go to clip four, which is, this gets to your point, which is the restraint Israel shows, it, it, the opposite image is, is, is what you're dealing with in Hamas. They get millions upon, hundreds of millions of dollars in aid. And what do they do with it? They, right. write, they, they literally put out hype videos. Right, showing that they they take that money, and you can hear it a little bit. Else, you can bring the sound up just a little bit. You can hear this. They're basically pulling up old piping, right. and they're making missiles out of it. Yeah. And those missiles are aimed in one place. Right. And, and you know, you see them do, and they literally put this stuff out. It's like it's like what they did with the attack. All that video you see, they shot it. They're right. the one. They're, this is absolutely an effort on their part to try to to, to scare off, or, or I don't even know if that's the right term, really, for Israel. I mean, they're not going to do that clearly. This talks about the drones you're talking. I mean, this is what they do. And, and so, when you have an uh, an enemy that that will do anything and will and will use the West's money against itself, it, it, this is right. a very it's a very difficult spot for Israel to be in. So, if you are Benjamin Netanyahu or you're sitting down with your war council, what are you telling them right now? Well, I mean, clearly the, you have an angry nation. And so what I would be telling them was, be careful, go guys. Right now they're going to move into Gaza. All right, that's urban warfare. All right. I mean, you're going to have to move through basically a territory with 2 million people in it, door to door, street to street, and you don't want to lose your army. And I remember they just called up 300,000 reservists. It's not like you just send them straight in. They still need to put uniforms on these guys. By the way, they don't have them. They've got a unit. They need to put body armor on everybody. They don't have it yet. You've got to integrate them into your regular army. You've got to have some restraint right now before you make an error in haste and really mess things up. So I, I'm going to guess they are probably pulling back and saying, okay, we're going to need to go into this in a more calculated way. We did all the bluster last week, but let's think this through. So did they go into Gaza today? Yes, I would call it probing action. Yeah. But I would think it's going to take a while, which is why this, this war is going to take a while. Yeah. They're going to have to really go through in a methodical way, especially with Egypt blocking the south way out. Right. Yeah. Um, you're piling people up in right. there. And now you're going to be in anti-tank guided missile territory. You were, do you really want tanks going down narrow streets? Probably not. Not. That means it's going to be infantry kicking in doors, door to door. This is going to be brutal. And so, then, and you add in things like yesterday's announcement that came out with um, the day of rage situation oh yeah. that came out on Friday, I should say, right. or it was it was aimed at, at Friday. Do you think that we'll see more and more of that? Because again, you and I were talking off before we started. Question. You know that we think you think that nobody, none of these cell folks have come through our open border in the last two years. Think oh, again, Christy. No, it's it's that's really good analysis, right? So let's think this through. We're now hearing it took them two years to plan this event, right? Two years to knock down fences and kill civilians. Or wait, is this the opening act of something much bigger? 
And now you start to think in terms of what they call asymmetric warfare. All right, we've had this open border. Anybody who thinks that the bad guys have not brought in sleeper cells is naive beyond belief. So what would you do here in the United States? Well, you can do gray terror. All right, you, you, you take out, um, oh, I don't know, rail lines. You blow up electricity, you know, tr transfer stations. This kind, you start forest fires. Anything you can to weaken or confuse a population. And then in the inner cities, the real deep concern right now is what kind of weapons have they put inside inner cities because we have left these borders open in the name of, I have, well, anyway, yeah. just leave it at that. So is America vulnerable? Yes. And we allowed it. So, so. What, in, in a, a lot of what we see now, and I think what is most uh, concerning to us is, is the way the reaction is within the country. So we'll get back to what this may, well, actually, let me put a bow on that, on, on what we, let's put a bow on the Israeli portion of this there. So this is brutal. They've got to go into Gaza. What, what, what do they do there? And then do you see if, if you're having to game this out, will they end up in a wider war? What yes. do you see in the next two years here? Oh, certainly a wider war. And, and you, then you're going to have all of the atrocities. And yes, there are going to be atrocities on both sides because this is the way, this is the way war is conducted. I mean, again, go back to scripture. Where are the Jebusites? They're wiped out. Go you know, on. the Amalekites, where right. are they? They're wiped out. Yeah. So the thinking there is so much different. All right, you must destroy the enemy. I think the term in the Old Testament was the ban of destruction. What? Women, children, the livestock, the tents, the idols, everything. This kind of thinking, again, is so foreign to Western thought. But once you get, again, once you talk to these guys inside the wire at Gitmo, all right, this is how they really think. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He would, he would, he's the so-called mastermind of 9-11. Mark, he, he prayed 10, 12 hours a day. What was, who is, what God was he praying to? Because he's basically praying for Los Angeles to be nuked. And then, oh, let's go have lunch. Yeah. I mean, the thinking is much different than what we can comprehend. And then, so, okay, so we end up in a longer war there. How does that end? Badly. Uh we're on the precipice of nuclear war. People have got to understand this. This is getting really scary. Someone has to start talking peace. Iran likely has nuclear weapons and the de delivery system to do it. Where would they send it? Probably to Tel Aviv. Yeah. Not Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is still a holy site yeah. for the Muslims. And so, no, the chances of this really escalating into something bad are, are ramping up and someone has to start talking peace here. How do we do that? At this point, I don't see it. Uh, Israel's going to need to extract its... Yeah, they can't yeah. leave it as it is. Right. And then the Muslim nations will have no choice but to respond to what's happening to their Muslim brothers. So, no, this is very serious times. And... All right, so let's get back to this country for a second because okay. I think there's been a lot of thought, and, and I, I wanted to because you mentioned how how we responded to this a, mm -hmm. as a country, and I think that there's been a lot of talk about a, a, a million different hot spots across the world. But one of the one of the most interesting cases is if we're going to go down as a country, it may well happen from within, and, and the way we respond to things. Let me just go through a couple things here with you that I found interesting in the wake of of what happened. And Ella, let's go to clip five. Um, and you talked about the way UNM responded yeah. to this. Did you read this? Yeah. I, I mean, and I don't know, but Chrissy, if you want to read this, I mean, UNM's response to the barbarity of what happened in Israel was was horrendous in every single way. Right. They say, as an inclusive and global institution, we recognize that many members of our community have experienced challenging and distressing circumstances related to social and political oppression, conflict, war, and genocide. Today, we unite as university leaders in response to the escalating conflict in Israel and Gaza and the unfortunate violence affecting fellow human beings, refusing to condemn the violence. It is impossible not to be profoundly affected by the dramatic and deeply disturbing information, chilling images that continue to emerge from the region. We express our condolences for the loss of life and stand in solidarity with the members of our community who have family, friends, and colleagues in the affected area and who may be directly impacted by the conflict. 
These individuals have courageously shared their personal experiences, concerns, frustrations, and sadness, and we ask our Lobo community to keep them and their loved ones in their thoughts, especially during this time while they're far from home. That is, to me, a disgusting response oh, from word, the University of New Mexico. It's a word salad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's written by some PR person. I mean, an- <laughs> right. So, how has this affected? We're a divided nation. And how has it affected the military? Because that's going to be a response here. Mark, Christy, the U.S. Army is down to 445,000 soldiers. We should be over half a million. Uh, we're having difficulty recruiting and have for a long time. Uh, young men, young women don't really want to join a woke organization. Getting that 17-year-old baseball pitcher who's not quite ready for college but maybe wants to be a ranger or a SEAL, they're not joining up. Uh, beyond that, we've got generals in dresses. We've got admirals wearing lipstick. Uh, our new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a four-star Air Force general, uh, he was the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And his very first speech, while all this is going on, was talking about diversity in the military. You can't, you can't be serious about this. Meanwhile, technologically, we want to still think that we're number one technologically. I'll tell you what, the Russian army has made huge advances in the last 20 months. Even Google's CEO came out and said, we can't believe Russia's electronic warfare capabilities. Right. And now you've got this battle-tested army. We're, we're not. And we have an army that was built for counter, um, counterinsurgency operations, really, COIN is the term. Yeah. Well, all right, because the last 20 years we've been kicking indoors in Afghanistan and right. Iraq. Right. And now we're going up against an enemy like this, where the technology is totally changed. They have hypersonic missiles. We don't. Their drones are now battle-tested. Ours aren't. And we're thinking we're just going to roll in, and this is going to be another cakewalk like Iraq. No, 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 no. So anyway, we need to reverse course very quickly and decide who we are and come together. The hard part about coming together is no one trusts the institutions anymore. Right. We have been lied to by the education establishment, by the media, by our courts, by our politicians, by our military. Everyone's light. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. How does a society come together when we don't trust each other? By the way, and I'll at last end with this, recruiting. 77% of the young, mostly men, 17 to 24, they don't qualify for the military. They're either obese or on drugs or on prescription meds. And of the 23% that remain, they don't feel very patriotic. They don't like America. Yeah. We're a racist, horrible na- nation, and why would I want to defend that? Well, how do you draw from that? You know what's happening in the Middle East? At least you know they believe in their cause. In Russia, they're signing up like crazy to join the war because they think Russia, Russia's existence is at stake. Right. And they're proud of their country. We're not seeing this here. We've, we've got to change the attitude really fast. And you see that with all the demonstrations and you go to university after university when all of this happened right. and you watch what they say. And you're right. There, there's a hatred of America. And then we also and I think you touched on this. We we are not sending our best to Washington, D.C. So, Ella, <laughs> just listen to a couple of these clips, which is Ella. let's go to clip eight. This is Ed Markey, senator from Massachusetts. It, what's so interesting to me, and for those of you that are listening to this, we'll, we'll walk you through it after it's done. He is literally shocked, and, you, when, and you'll see his face when, when at the reaction he receives from this statement. Let's go ahead and listen to this. There must be a de-escalation of the current violence. The United States should... Wow. He is... We... He doesn't know what to do. No. He is completely shocked. Elizabeth Warren is standing right behind him. She is shocked at the reaction that he gets. Now, now the reason the de-escalation is such an offensive thing is it'd be like coming here on, you know, uh, September 12th. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. September 12th and saying, hey, de-escalate. Let's leave Afghanistan alone. Uh, so it, it's, a ridic- it's a patently ridiculous comment from someone, a senator who's completely out of touch. But it gets even worse when you go to the House of Representatives, where you have a group of people that openly supports Hamas effectively right. now and and they are rarely 
held to task over this. Well, Rashida Tlaib is one of the worst of these. A Fox News reporter chased her down and asked her about her reaction to the barbarity of what Hamas did. And here's what she did. She's a congresswoman in the United States of America. I mean, she won't answer. She walks away. She has a Palestinian flag hanging out in front of her office. Right. By the way, no American flag out in front of her office. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is the sort of thing that when you tear this country apart from within, it's as dangerous as anything we face. Right. Oh, this is what has happened throughout history. You know, when you saw this with Rome, you saw this with Greece, and it's and it's here. Can we reverse it? Yes. Has America been through crises before where we were divided like this? Yeah, the Civil War was like this. Yeah. Actually, the Revolutionary War was like this. During the Depression, people don't talk about it very much, but you know, people were at each other's throats prior to World War II. Should we even get involved in this based on what we've just been through economically and so on? Do we have the ability to come back together quickly? Yes, but it does depend on leadership. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have leadership that still believes in at least, look, we've done a lot of good things in this country over a lot of years and, you know, quit tearing it down. It's time we start building it back up. Do you think we have time to wait for the 24 election? I mean, you know, that's the fear I see is that. You know, hopefully we see some change in 24. Christy, if I were to put odds on it right now, I'd say there's a 25% chance we won't have an election. And that how does that up. how does that play out to you? If it, 25% chance that will they suspend the election because yeah. of world crisis? Events? Yeah, they suspend it because of crisis. We're going to we have economic crisis coming. We have a banking crisis coming. We have a dollar crisis coming. I've never seen such a confluence of macro things coming together at the same time. And yes, so I think we are going to have a banking crisis before then. I think we're going to have a currency crisis before then. We're going to have probably a stock market crisis in here. You're going to have civil unrest. You watch. This is all going to be coming simultaneously. And then we're going to have the military crisis. This Again, this is all expanding. And they're going to say, oh, in order, sorry, we just can't do it. We're going to have to do now. Again, I've got three quarter, 75% chance we still have the elections. But every month I'm kind of raising the percentage. You can see what's happening here. The left does not want to lose power. They know Biden has no popularity. They know that they are losing everywhere on every issue. How do you stay in power? You, you clip him. They're going to clip him. Well, you're going to take Biden out, right. and who are they going to put in? And uh, they don't want Kamala Harris. No. no. So what are you going to do? You're going to bring in the white, the white guy from California, yeah. and yeah. you're going to take out the female African-American? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, how do, you, how do you sell that? Right. Yeah. We've talked about that. Yeah, they have yeah. all kinds of issues here. Right. But the best way is just declare emergency and say, look, we'll get to the election in 2025 or something like that. Could I see that playing out? Yes. And we'll see. So Wow. Well, let's talk a little about you and I were talking um, before we started on finance, because obviously that is your world now, mainly. That's the the bulk of how you spend your time. Right. And you were telling me some things that we should kind of keep in mind because you do see. You, you said the markets are going to change. They're already changing. We're already, you know, we're in inflation. What does war mean for this? How is this war going to okay. affect our finances? Tell okay. us a little bit about that. War is always inflationary. Always. You got to spend money. Yeah. It's money. And we're $33 trillion in debt already. So we're going to be ratcheting that up. Meanwhile, the world is moving away from the dollar. The Chinese are redeeming our debt. Uh, they've already redeemed half a trillion. Let's see. The Japanese have redeemed a quarter of it. There are what our ally, quarter of a trillion in the last six months, Chinese out. The Saudis are selling our debt. Okay, what are they doing as they sell the debt? They get dollars. Now, this will seem odd to you, but as they get dollars, it's demand for dollars. Well, if demand for Ford F-150s suddenly rises, what does Rich Ford do? They raise the price. prices. Yeah. Right. Same thing happens with currencies. So the dollar is strengthening it, and we're you know pumping our chest, the dollar is strong. Well, yeah, it's because they're redeeming our debt. Then once... They redeem it and they've got these dollars. What are they doing with them? Well, the Chinese are buying farmland in the U.S. 
They're buying ranches in Argentina, yeah. uh, you know, mining properties in Australia. They're buying uh, natural resources all across Africa. They're front running a currency crisis. And by the way, the, the Chinese yuan is a basket case. So is the Japanese right. yen. So is the euro. The world wants a reset here. All right. So how do you transition your wealth during a reset? And by the way, let's add another element to this. Wars are natural resource intensive. Every country in the world is hoarding oil, except the United States. We're draining our strategic <laughs> petroleum right. reserve. Right. It, it's stunning to me. What did I just show you? Let's see. Um, Citigroup takes delivery of 100,000 tons of aluminum, 40,000 tons of zinc. Mark, Christy, think about it. This is an investment bank yeah. taking delivery of tons of aluminum. Why would you do that? Oh, to make money. Look at what the really rich guys are doing. Central banks are buying gold. Uh, just last month, central banks, no, August, they bought 219 tons of gold. Who are the central banks? Oh, these are the guys who make euros, yen, dollars, won. Hey, guys, you told us your product's so darn good. Why are you loading up on gold? Yeah. Right. Why is Bill Gates buying all that farmland? Yeah. You get the idea. What they are anticipating is a currency crisis, and the public doesn't see this at all because right. we're all focused on pronouns, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> gender right. issues, right. and all kinds. So of how do we? Per if you're if you're your average family here in New Mexico and, and you see this starting to develop and you see this train coming, what do you say to people? What can we do? Well, I'm going to tell you what we're advising clients, and you can't give blanket advice to everybody because of right. the situation. We are investing in food. We're investing in energy. We're investing in commodities. We're investing in precious metals. We're investing in water. Things that can't be printed or devalued. We're doing what these other people are doing. Now, in the short term, the dollar will be strengthening, strengthening, strengthening. And currencies die the way a star dies. They get brighter, 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 and they go supernova, and then it goes black. I believe this is coming because it must. Here's what's happened. We're 33 trillion in debt. Actually, it's higher than that, but we'll use their number. We have saddled your kids with 33 trillion of debt. This is just mathematics. They can't haul the wagon. Yeah. Neither can they haul the wagon in Europe or in Asia. We're going to cut the kids loose. How do you do that? You devalue currencies. And it's what the ancient Greeks did, the Romans, Chinese, Germans, America. We, everybody does it. We're on the brink of this. When that happens, there is economic upheaval. This is when you get the civil unrest, which is what they're planning for. You can see this coming. Meanwhile, they're front running and buying up as much natural resource product as they Tell can. Tell me what devaluing the currency means for your average person. Oh, okay. Let's see. If you have uh, $10,000 in the bank on Friday and then they devalue the currency by half on Monday morning when you wake up, the, you're, it's worth $5,000. Boom. Just by decree. And so does this happen throughout history? Yeah, that's one way to do Who it. Who would do it? Would the Fed do it yeah, here? Yeah, the government just announces yeah. it. Yeah, And they just say we've devalued Jeez. the currency. Yeah. Well, now you are you buy half of what you... And now prices immediately double. Right. And now what happens to these poor kids who can barely afford rent right now or, you know, all of these yeah. other things? And now they act out. I mean, you're already seeing it. What's happening to shoplifting? Oh, excuse me, shrinkage, what they call it. Right, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. What's happening to crime? What's that? All of this is rising on these economic pressures that hit the poor first. Meanwhile, the rich insulate themselves. So what do you do? Front run, like everybody else is. <laughs> Get ahead of it on, on food. Buy what you can now. Get your repair parts now. We're going to have supply chain problems again. War disrupts supply chains. And so what goods you do get, the prices are higher. If you need new tires for the car, get it now. And so has America been through this before? Yes. Can we get through it again? Yes. But we have to come together as a people and not be hating on each other. So. Wow. I know. This is why nobody invites me to parties. I, unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even, I feel like we should, we have to end on something. And I, Positive. Yes. I want to, I want to end on uh, talking, just briefly circling back to faith for a minute. Right. And how important it is in, in times like this to to be able to turn to a God who who 
who loves you, who is in, involved in your life, who who knows every hair on your right. head. So how do you how do you kind of marry all that all of this together? You have to repent. That's the way it always turns around. It doesn't turn around in the horizontal where you have a new governor or you change policy. It doesn't start there. It starts here and it's the connection up. We've lived in a society that has separated totally from God. Mm-hmm. Look, we don't need you. We got this. Go away. You can't be in our schools, our courtrooms, the public square. We're good. Well, fine. God will honor our will. Well, but when God leaves, love leaves, empathy leaves, unity leaves, all of it, the good stuff goes away. And what comes is what we've got now. So can we reverse it? Yes, actually very quickly. But we have to, if you start on your knees, not doing this, doing this, right. once we do that, you'd be surprised how quickly a society can turn around. Mm-hmm. I would love for that to start here in New Mexico, but we need leadership that thinks like this, right. shows like this help, right. and it will start from the bottom up. And yeah, that yeah. is all, I believe that's all coming, uh, but... <laughs> We'll see how much pain we have to go through first to get there. get there. Yeah, well, we and we've had you know Skip and um, his son both from Calvary come on, and yeah. they 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 talk a lot about how it's some of the darkest times they've seen, but they also are seeing you know this revolution of the you know the people coming back to God too, and seeing a lot of youth given you know and and learn about Jesus more and want to give right. their heart and want to serve. So we're hoping for that too. Well, I'll tell you yeah, what. But let me just add. This. Think about think about the honor that our souls have gotten. Our souls are here for this at this time. We yeah. were chosen. Right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So now we have a choice. All right, what are we going to do? Are we going to shrink and shrivel? Or are you going to engage? Are you going to be this light? Mm-hmm. Come on, let's go. Yeah. He's chosen me. He's chosen you, you, you. For such what a time honor. as this. Yeah. 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 Get like, out from underneath the table. I mean, we put are, it up on top. Yeah. We were born in the Middle Ages. Life at age 10 was the same as 70. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, right? it's true. Right? Yeah, it's true. Wow. Okay. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. You're I know. I, no yeah, we, intended. Yeah. No, we, we enjoyed it. We'll, we'll have you back talk more about, about where we go from here. This is a... This is a difficult time. There, right. There's no doubt. And, and we'll get we investment that. advice from you offline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, it's important. But uh, again, you are, you, are a, you are a benefit to this state, and uh, we, are, we are honored to have you on, and we really do appreciate it. It was kind of you to have me. Oh, Thank no, you. we appreciate it. Thanks very much, Greg. You're listening to the No Doubt About It podcast. Back to your hosts, Christy and Mark Ronchetti. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, lots of information there, lots of different ideas and, uh, you know, the, his his thoughts on if there might not be an election in 24. That was pretty interesting. I haven't I, heard that one yet. So. Yeah, I, no, there, that's out there. Um, it, yeah. It, but it's just, you know, again, what we try to do on the show is bring you as much information as we can and, and just interesting people mm-hmm. who, who think things through. And, and I and I put Greg in that category. Absolutely. He's very, very smart. But we yep. can't end on this. Okay. Yes, we, true. Let's end on something. You you teased some crazy oh Bigfoot gosh. thing because yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what you like to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, because I You and I think, Ava and your Bigfoot thing. Yeah, because because it's happening. So uh, <laughs> let's start gosh. with the video. So I want to tell you first, this video came out last week from uh, basically between Durango and Silverton. So many of you I know have been there. Uh, you go That's north. what they're on then. They're on the train. They're on the railroad. Yeah. I thought on they the, were yeah. on some sort of tram when I first No, no, no. They're this. on the narrow gauge railroad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on it, that you're right. It looks like a tram. It totally. Does. Okay. But so so they were, they're going up. I think they're headed north towards Silverton. Okay. And they look out out to the side of the train and this is what they see and for those of you who can't who are just listening to this it it is someone on two feet it looks like a, a large sort of uh bigfoot right there in the middle of some brush mm-hmm. and i did zoom in on it on my phone and you could i have to say i because i first thought oh it's an elk or it's a right. bear or something but when you really do zoom in on it yeah, else you, can you hit the zoom? Yeah, yeah. see, there it you is. Can, yeah, you can kind of see it's that it's too. Yeah, it looks like a big ape. It and, does, and it looks like a big ape that goes and sits down. Yes, um, it does. So, so I don't and know. if you want to go look at it, you can just put it online too. If if you happen to be listening to us, but else, let's go to clip twenty one. So if you're excited about this, I oh no. I was a little disappointed in this. What's okay, happening? Okay, so well, take a look here. So this is um, 
uh, from the New York Post. It says an alleged Bigfoot sighting in Colorado seems to be a big footstep in the wrong direction. Ooh. Experts say. So earlier, shocking. Well, no. I, so hold on. So <laughs> earlier this week, Wyoming resident Shannon Parker posted photos and a video online seeming to show Sasquatch traversing a rocky area before popping a squat in the southwest part of the state, meaning southwest Colorado. However, Matthew Moneymaker head of the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization and former host of Finding Bigfoot, told the Post that there are several giveaways that debunk the sighting. Oh, so this, this just shows you, I'm here for the truth, okay? Uh-huh. He said, he said, number one, a couple different things. First of all, he said it looks like basically someone in an ape costume. Is it, He just threw that right out there. And then he said he also inferred that the six foot, seven foot tall, uh, six foot, seven tall, Tan monster filmed moving through the mountains between Silverton and Durango appeared familiar as it's there's a local Bigfoot costume um, and a local business called Sasquatch Expedition Campers. And they are known to do promotional activities. Oh, so the, maybe this is like a viral marketing video? Yeah, it could be. You got suckered in. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I'm not, I don't know what I'm You're willing to believe. You're not sure? Well, I, mean, no, I, I bring you the truth. So yeah. even if the truth doesn't line up for what I want it to line uh-huh. up for, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. There is no Bigfoot guy. It doesn't exist. <sighs> it is a total myth. Yeah, it is a tough one to defend. Yeah, I can't defend this one. I mean, I believe in a lot of other weird kind so of- So you believe in aliens? Um, I believe that I had something. I saw yeah. something yeah. that okay. time we've talked yeah. about, and there I do believe that there's ghosts. Okay. So those are the two things I that are kind of those weirdo things. Yes. But I do. I can see some evidence of those things. Right. I have yet to see any evidence of Bigfoot that's actually real. Okay, working on that. Okay, and again, I'm on it. again, we have an iPhone. You can zoom in now. I understand. And and yet they can't do it. Oh my no, gosh, no, people that, zoom that was, out. That was a ways away. See, people zoom out now, too. And they're like, oh, he's like out of focus. I'm I get like, it. We've I come a long it. way since the 1960s when we first started filming this stuff. I get anyway, it. Anyway, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, coming up Thursday, we, uh, we're working on a few different things here. Obviously, we'll update you on what's going on in the Mideast. We'll update you on what's happening across America and especially here in New Mexico. And we appreciate you joining us. And we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks, you guys. Have a good week. You've been listening to the No Doubt About It podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at No Doubt About It podcast. No Doubt About It. The No Doubt About It podcast is a Choose Adventure Media production. See you next time on No Doubt About It. There is no doubt about it.